Chapter 2, The Categorial Scheme. This chapter contains an anticipatory sketch of the primary notions which constitute the philosophy of organism. The whole of the subsequent discussion in these lectures has the purpose of rendering this summary intelligible and of showing that it embodies generic notions inevitably presupposed in our reflective experience presupposed but rarely expressed an explicit distinction. Four notions may be singled out from this summary by reason of the fact that they involve some divergence from antecedent philosophical thought. These notions are that of an actual entity, that of a prehension, that of a nexus, and that of the ontological principle. Philosophical thought has made for itself difficulties by dealing exclusively in very abstract notions, such as those of mere awareness, mere private sensation, mere emotion, mere purpose, mere appearance, mere causation. These are the ghosts of the old faculties, banished from psychology, but still haunting metaphysics. There can be no mere togetherness of such abstractions. The result is that philosophical discussion is enmeshed in the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. In the three notions, actual entity prehension nexus, an endeavor has been made to base philosophical thought upon the most concrete elements in our experience. Actual entities, also termed actual occasions, are the final real things of which the world is made up. There is no going behind actual entities to find anything more real. They differ among themselves. God is an actual entity, and so is the most trivial puff of existence in far-off, empty space. But though there are gradations of importance and diversities of function, yet in the principles which actuality exemplifies, all are on the same level. The final facts are all alike actual entities, and these actual entities are drops of experience, complex and interdependent. In its recurrence to the notion of a plurality, of actual entities, the philosophy of organism, is through and through Cartesian. The ontological principle broadens and extends a general principle laid down by John Locke in his essay when he asserts that power is a great part of our complex ideas of substances. The notion of substance is transformed into that of actual entity. The notion of power is transformed into the principle that the reasons for things are always to be found in the composite nature of definite actual entities, in the nature of God for reasons of the highest absoluteness, in the nature of definite temporal actual entities for reasons which refer to a particular environment. The ontological principle can be summarized as no actual entity, then no reason. Each actual entity is analyzable in an indefinite number of ways. In some modes of analysis, the component elements are more abstract than in other modes of analysis. The analysis of an actual entity into prehensions is that mode of analysis which exhibits the most concrete elements in the nature of actual entities. This mode of analysis will be termed the division of the actual entity in question. Each actual entity is divisible in an indefinite number of ways, and each way of division yields its definite quota of prehensions. A prehension reproduces in itself the general characteristics of an actual entity. It is referent to an external world, and in this sense will be said to have a vector character. It involves emotion and purpose and valuation and causation. In fact, any characteristic of an actual entity is reproduced in a prehension. 
It might have been a complete actuality, but by reason of a certain incomplete partiality, apprehension is only a subordinate element in an actual entity. A reference to the complete actuality is required to give the reason why such apprehension is what it is in respect to its subjective form. This subjective form is determined by the subjective aim at further integration, so as to obtain the satisfaction of the completed subject. In other words, final causation automatism are interconnected philosophical principles. With the purpose of obtaining a one substance, cosmology, prehensions, or a generalization from Descartes' mental cogitations and from Locke's ideas, to express the most concrete mode of analysis applicable to every grade of individual actuality. Descartes and Locke maintained a two substance ontology, Descartes explicitly, Locke by implication, Descartes. The mathematical physicist emphasized his account of corporeal substance, and Locke the physician and the sociologist confined himself to an account of mental substance, the philosophy of organism and its scheme for one type of actual entities, adopts the view that Locke's account of mental substance embodies, in a very special form, a more penetrating philosophic description than does Descartes' account of corporeal substance. Nevertheless, Descartes' account must find its place in the philosophic scheme. On the whole, this is the moral to be drawn from the monadology of Leibniz. His monads are best conceived as generalizations of contemporary notions of mentality. The contemporary notions of physical bodies only enter into his philosophy subordinately and derivatively. The philosophy of organism endeavors to hold the balance more evenly, but it does start with the generalization of Locke's account of mental operations. Actual entities involve each other by reason of their prehensions of each other. There are thus real individual facts of the togetherness of actual entities which are real, individual, and particular in the same sense in which actual entities and the prehensions are real, individual, and particular. Any such particular fact of togetherness among actual entities is called a nexus. Plural form is written nexus. The ultimate facts of immediate actual experience are actual entities, prehensions, and nexus. All else is, for our experience, derivative abstraction. The explanatory purpose of philosophy is often misunderstood. Its business is to explain the emergence of the more abstract things from the more concrete things. It is a complete mistake to ask how concrete particular fact can be built up out of universals. The answer is, in no way. The true philosophic question is, how can concrete fact exhibit entities abstract from itself and yet participated in by its own nature? In other words, philosophy is explanatory of abstraction and not of concreteness. It is by reason of their instinctive grasp of this ultimate truth that, in spite of much association with arbitrary fancifulness and atavistic mysticism, types of platonic philosophy retain their abiding appeal. They seek the forms and the facts. Each fact is more than its forms, and each form participates throughout the world of facts. The definiteness of fact is due to its forms. But the individual fact is a creature, and creativity is the ultimate behind all forms, inexplicable by forms, and conditioned by its creatures. The categories. 1. The category of the ultimate. 2. Categories of existence. 3. Categories of explanation. 4. Categorial obligations. It is the purpose of the discussion in these lectures to make clear the meaning of these categories, their applicability, and their adequacy 
the course of the discussion will disclose how very far they are from satisfying the ideal. Every entity should be a specific instance of one category of existence. Every explanation should be a specific instance of categories of explanation. And every obligation should be a specific instance of categorial obligations. The category of the ultimate expresses the general principle presupposed in the three more special categories. The category of the ultimate. Creativity, many, one, are the ultimate notions involved in the meaning of the synonymous terms thing, being, entity. These three notions complete the category of the ultimate and are presupposed in all the more special categories. The term one does not stand for the integral number one, which is a complex special notion. It stands for the general idea underlying alike the indefinite article a or an, and the definite article the, and the demonstratives this or that, and the relatives which or what or how. It stands for the singularity of an entity. The term many presupposes the term one, and the term one presupposes the term many. The term many conveys the notion of disjunctive diversity. This notion is an essential element in the concept of being. There are many beings in disjunctive diversity. Creativity is the universal of universals, characterizing ultimate matter of fact. It is that ultimate principle by which the many, which are the universe disjunctively, become the one actual occasion, which is the universe conjunctively. It lies in the nature of things that the many enter into complex unity. Creativity is the principle of novelty. An actual occasion is a novel entity diverse from any entity in the many which it unifies. Thus, creativity introduces novelty into the content of the many, which are the universe disjunctively. The creative advance is the application of this ultimate principle of creativity to each novel situation which it originates. Together is a generic term covering the various special ways in which various sorts of entities are together in any one actual occasion. Thus together presupposes the notions creativity, many, one, identity, and diversity. The ultimate metaphysical principle is the advance from disjunction to conjunction. Creating a novel entity other than the entities given in disjunction. The novel entity is at once the togetherness of the many which it finds, and also it is one among the disjunctive many which it leaves. It is a novel entity, disjunctively among the many entities which it synthesizes. The many become one, and are increased by one. In their natures, entities are disjunctively many in process, of passage into conjunctive unity. The category of the ultimate replaces Aristotle's category of primary substance. Thus the production of novel togetherness is the ultimate notion embodied in the term concrescence. These ultimate notions of production of novelty and of concrete togetherness are inexplicable either in terms of higher universals or in terms of the components participating in the concrescence. The analysis of the components abstracts from the concrescence. The sole appeal is to intuition. The categories of existence. There are eight categories of existence. One, actual entities also termed actual occasions, or final realities, or res vere. Two, prehensions, or concrete facts of relatedness, 
three, nexus, or public matters of fact. Four, subjective forms or private matters of fact. Five, eternal objects or pure potentials for the specific determination of fact or forms of definiteness. Six, propositions or matters of fact in potential determination, or impure potentials for the specific determination of matters of fact, or theories. 7. Multiplicities or pure disjunctions of diverse entities. 8. Contrasts, or modes of synthesis of entities in one prehension. Among these eight categories of existence, actual entities and eternal objects stand out with a certain extreme finality. The other types of existence have a certain intermediate character. The eighth category includes an indefinite progression of categories, as we proceed from contrasts to contrasts of contrasts, and on indefinitely to higher grades of contrasts. There are 27 categories of explanation. 1. That the actual world is a process and that the process is the becoming of actual entities. Thus, actual entities are creatures. They are also termed actual occasions. 2. That in the becoming of an actual entity, the potential unit of many entities, actual and non-actual, acquires the real unity of the one actual entity, so that the actual entity is the real concrescence of many potentials. 3. That in the becoming of an actual entity, novel prehensions, nexus, subjective forms, propositions, multiplicities, and contrasts also become. But there are no novel eternal objects. 4. That the potentiality for being an element in a real concrescence of many entities into one actuality is the one general metaphysical character attaching to all entities, actual and non-actual, and that every item in its universe is involved in each concrescence. In other words, it belongs to the nature of a being that it is a potential for every becoming. This is the principle of relativity. 5. That no two actual entities originate from an identical universe, though the difference between the two universes only consists in some actual entities included in one and not in the other, and in the subordinate entities which each actual entity introduces into the world. The eternal objects are the same for all actual entities. The nexus of actual entities in the universe correlate to a concrescence is termed the actual world correlate to that concrescence. 6. That each entity in the universe of a given concrescence can, so far as its own nature is concerned, be implicated in that concrescence in one or other of many modes, but in fact it is implicated only in one mode, that the particular mode of implication is only rendered fully determinate by that concrescence, though it is conditioned by the correlate universe. This indetermination, rendered determinate in the real concrescence, is the meaning of potentiality. It is a conditioned indetermination and is therefore called a real potentiality. 7. That an eternal object can be described only in terms of its potentiality for ingression into the becoming of actual entities, and that its analysis only discloses other eternal objects. It is a pure potential. The term ingression refers to the particular mode in which the potentiality of an eternal object is realized in a particular actual entity, contributing to the definiteness of that actual entity. 8. That two descriptions are required for an actual entity. A. 
one which is analytical of its potentiality for objectification and the becoming of other actual entities and B, another which is analytical of the process, which constitutes its own becoming. The term objectification refers to the particular mode in which the potentiality of one actual entity is realized in another actual entity. 9. That how an actual entity becomes constitutes what that actual entity is, so that the two descriptions of an actual entity are not independent. Its being is constituted by its becoming. This is the principle of process. 10. That the first analysis of an actual entity into its most concrete elements discloses it to be a concrescence of prehensions which have originated in its process of becoming. All further analysis is an analysis of prehensions. Analysis in terms of prehensions is termed division. 11. That every prehension consists of three factors. A the subject which is prehending, namely the actual entity in which that prehension is a concrete element, b the datum which is prehended, c the subjective form which is how that subject prehends that datum, prehensions of actual entities, i.e. prehensions whose data involve actual entities are termed physical prehensions, and prehensions of eternal objects are termed conceptual prehensions. Consciousness is not necessarily involved in the subjective forms of either type of prehension. 12. That there are two species of prehensions, positive prehensions, which are termed feelings, and negative prehensions, which are said to eliminate from feeling. Negative prehensions also have subjective forms. A negative prehension holds its datum as inoperative in this progressive concrescence of prehensions constituting the unity of the subject. 13. That there are many species of subjective forms, such as emotions, valuations, purposes, aversions, aversions, consciousness, etc. 14. That a nexus is a set of actual entities and the unity of relatedness constituted by their prehensions of each other? Or what is the same thing conversely expressed constituted by their objectifications in each other? 15. That a proposition is the unity of certain actual entities and their potentiality for forming a nexus with its potential relatedness partially defined by certain eternal objects which have the unity of one complex eternal object. The actual entities involved are termed the logical subjects. The complex eternal object is the predicate. 16. That a multiplicity consists of many entities and its unity is constituted by the fact that all its constituent entities severally satisfy at least one condition which no other entity satisfies. Every statement about a particular multiplicity can be expressed as a statement referent either a to all its members severally or b to an indefinite sum of its members severally, or c as a denial of one of these statements. Any statement incapable of being expressed in this form is not a statement about multiplicity, though it may be a statement about an entity closely allied to some multiplicity, i.e. systematically, allied to each member of some multiplicity. 17. That whatever is a datum for a feeling has a unity as felt. Thus the many components of a complex datum have a unity. This unity is a contrast of entities. In a sense, this means that there are an endless number of categories of existence, since the synthesis of entities into a contrast in general produces a new existential type. For example, a proposition is, in a sense, a contrast. 
For the practical purposes of human understanding, it is sufficient to consider a few basic types of existence and to lump the more derivative types together under the heading of contrasts. The most important of such contrasts is the affirmation-negation contrast in which a proposition and a nexus obtain synthesis in one datum, the members of the nexus being the logical subjects of the proposition. 18. That every condition to which the process of becoming conforms in any particular instance has its reason either in the character of some actual entity in the actual world of that concrescence, or in the character of the subject which is in the process of concrescence. This category of explanation is termed the ontological principle. It could also be termed the principle of efficient and final causation. This ontological principle means that actual entities are the only reasons, so that to search for a reason is to search for one or more actual entities. It follows that any condition to be satisfied by one actual entity in its process expresses a fact either about the real internal constitutions of some other actual entities or about the subjective aim conditioning that process. The phrase real internal constitution is to be found in Locke's essay concerning human understanding, and thus the real internal, but generally in substances, unknown constitution of things whereon their discoverable qualities depend may be called their essence. Also the terms prehension and feeling are to be compared with the various significations of Locke's term idea, but they are adopted as more general and more neutral terms than idea as used by Locke, who seems to restrict them to conscious mentality. Also the ordinary logical account of propositions expresses only a restricted aspect of their role in the universe namely when they are the data of feelings whose subjective forms are those of judgments. It is an essential doctrine in the philosophy of organism that the primary function of a proposition is to be relevant as a lure for feeling. For example, some propositions are the data of feelings with subjective forms, such as to constitute those feelings to be the enjoyment of a joke. Other propositions are felt with feelings whose subjective forms are horror, disgust, or indignation. The subjective aim which controls the becoming of a subject is that subject feeling a proposition with the subjective form of purpose to realize it in that process of self-creation. 19. That the fundamental types of entities are actual entities and eternal objects, and that the other types of entities only express how all entities of the two fundamental types are in community with each other in the actual world. 20. That to function means to contribute determination to the actual entities in the nexus of some actual world. Thus, the determinateness and self-identity of one entity cannot be abstracted from the community of the diverse functionings of all entities. Determination is analyzable into definiteness and position, where definiteness is the illustration of select eternal objects and position is relative status in a nexus of actual entities. 21. An entity is actual when it has significance for itself. By this, it is meant that an actual entity functions in respect to its own determination. Thus, an actual entity combines self-identity with self-diversity. 22. That an actual entity by functioning in respect to itself plays diverse roles in self-formation. Without losing its self-identity, it is self-creative and in its process of creation transforms its diversity of roles into one coherent role. 
Thus, becoming is the transformation of incoherence into coherence, and in each particular instance ceases with this attainment. 23. That this self-functioning is the real internal constitution of an actual entity. It is the immediacy of the actual entity. An actual entity is called the subject of its own immediacy. 24. The functioning of one actual entity in the self-creation of another actual entity is the objectification of the former. For the latter actual entity, the functioning of an eternal object in the self-creation of an actual entity is the ingression of the eternal object in the actual entity. 25. The final phase in the process of concrescence constituting an actual entity is one complex, fully determinate feeling. This final phase is termed the satisfaction. It is fully determinate, A, as to its genesis, B, as to its objective character, for the transcendent creativity, and C, as to its prehension, positive or negative, of every item in its universe. 24. Each element in the genetic process of an actual entity has one self-consistent function, however complex in the final satisfaction. 27. In a process of concrescence, there is a succession of phases in which new prehensions arise by integration of prehensions and antecedent phases. In these integrations, feelings contribute their subjective forms and their data to the formation of novel integral prehensions, but negative prehensions contribute only to their subjective forms. The process continues till all prehensions or components in the one determinate integral satisfaction. There are nine categorical obligations. One, the category of the subjective unity. The many feelings which belong to an incomplete phase in the process of an actual entity though unintegrated by reason of the incompleteness of the phase, are compatible for integration by reason of the unity of their subject. Two, the category of objective identity. There can be no duplication of any element in the objective datum of the satisfaction of an actual entity, so far as concerns the function of that element in the satisfaction. Here, as always, the term satisfaction means the one complex, fully determinate feeling, which is the completed phase in the process. This category expresses that each element has one self-consistent function, however complex. Logic is the general analysis of self-consistency. 3. The category of objective diversity. There can be no coalescence of diverse elements in the objective datum of an actual entity so far as concerns the functions of that satisfaction. Coalescence here means the notion of diverse elements exercising an absolute identity of function, devoid of the contrasts inherent in their diversities. For the category of conceptual valuation, from each physical feeling, there is the derivation of a purely conceptual feeling, whose datum is the eternal object determinant of the definiteness of the actual entity or of the nexus physically felt. 5. The category of conceptual reversion. There is secondary origination of conceptual feelings with data which are partially identical with and partially diverse from the eternal objects forming the data in the first phase of the mental pole. The diversity is a relevant diversity determined by the subjective aim. Note that category 
4 concerns conceptual reproduction of physical feeling in category 5 concerns conceptual diversity from physical feeling. 6. The category of transmutation, when in accordance with category 4, or with categories 4 and 5, one and the same conceptual feeling is derived impartially by apprehending subject from its analogous simple physical feelings of various actual entities in its actual world than in a subsequent phase of integration of these simple physical feelings together with the derivate conceptual feeling. The prehending subject may transmute the datum of this conceptual feeling into a characteristic of some nexus containing those prehended actual entities among its members or of some part of that nexus. In this way, the nexus, or its part, thus characterized as the objective datum of a feeling, entertained by this prehending subject. It is evident that the complete datum of the transmuted feeling is a contrast, namely, the nexus as one in contrast with the eternal object. This type of contrast is one of the meanings of the notion qualification of physical substance by quality. This category is the way in which the philosophy of organism, which is an atomic theory of actuality, meets a perplexity which is inherent in all monadic cosmologies. Leibniz, in his monadology, meets the same difficulty by a theory of confused perception, but he fails to make clear how confusion originates. 7. The category of subjective harmony. The valuations of conceptual feelings are mutually determined by the adaptation of those feelings to be contrasted elements congruent with the subjective aim. Category 1 and Category 7 jointly express a pre-established harmony in the process of concrescence of any one subject. Category 1 has to do with data felt and Category 7 with the subjective forms of the conceptual feelings. This pre-established harmony is an outcome of the fact that no prehension can be considered an abstraction from its subject, although it originates in the process creative of its subject. 8. The category of subjective intensity. The subjective aim whereby there is origination of conceptual feeling is that intensity of feeling, A, in the immediate subject and B, in the relevant future. This double aim at the immediate present and the relevant future is less divided than appears on the surface. For the determination of the relevant future and the anticipatory feeling respecting provision for its grade of intensity are elements affecting the immediate complex of feeling. The greater part of mortality hinges on the determination of relevance in the future. The relevant future consists of those elements in the anticipated future which are felt with effective intensity by the present subject by reason of the real potentiality for them to be derived from itself. 9. The category of freedom and determination. The concrescence of each individual actual entity is internally determined and is externally free. This category can be condensed into the formula that in each concrescence, whatever is determinable is determined, but that there is always a remainder for the decision of the subject, superject of that concrescence. This subject, superject, is the universe in that synthesis, and beyond it there is non-entity. This final decision is the reaction of the unity of the whole to its own internal determination. This reaction is the final modification of emotion, appreciation, and purpose. But the decision of the whole arises out of the determination of the parts, so as to be strictly relevant to it. The whole of the subsequent discussion and the subsequent parts either leads up to these categories of the four types, or is explanatory of them. 
or is considering our experience of the world in the light of these categories. But a few preliminary notes may be useful. It follows from the fourth category of explanation that the notion of complete abstraction is self-contradictory, for you cannot abstract the universe from any entity, actual or non-actual, so as to consider that entity in complete isolation. Whenever we think of some entity, we are asking, what is fit for here? In a sense, every entity pervades the whole world. For this question has a definite answer for each entity in respect to any actual entity, or any nexus of actual entities. It follows from the first category of explanation that becoming is a creative advance into novelty. It is for this reason that the meaning of the phrase, the actual world, is relative to the becoming of a definite actual entity which is both novel and actual, relatively to that meaning and to no other meaning of that phrase. This conversely, each actual entity corresponds to a meaning of the actual world peculiar to itself. This point is dealt with more generally in the categories of explanation 3 and 5. An actual world is a nexus, and the actual world of one actual entity sinks to the level of a subordinate nexus and actual worlds beyond that actual entity. The first, the fourth, the eighteenth, and twenty-seventh categories state different aspects of one and the same general metaphysical truth. The first category states the doctrine in a general way that every ultimate actuality embodies in its own essence what Alexander terms a principle of unrest, namely its becoming. The fourth category applies this doctrine to the very notion of an entity. It asserts that the notion of an entity means an element contributory to the process of becoming we have in this category the utmost generalization of the notion of relativity. The 18th category asserts that the obligations imposed on the becoming of any particular actual entity arise from the constitutions of other actual entities. The four categories of explanation 10 to 13 constitute the repudiation of the notion of vacuous actuality, which haunts realistic philosophy. The term vacuous actuality here means the notion of a res vera devoid of subjective immediacy. This repudiation is fundamental for the organic philosophy. The notion of vacuous actuality is very closely allied to the notion of the inherence of quality in substance. Both notions in their misapplication as fundamental metaphysical categories find their chief support in a misunderstanding of the true analysis of presentational immediacy. It is fundamental to the metaphysical doctrine of the philosophy of organism that the notion of an actual entity as the unchanging subject of change is completely abandoned. An actual entity is at once the subject experiencing and the superject of its experiences. It is subject superject, and neither half of this description can for a moment be lost sight of. The term subject will be mostly employed when the actual entity is considered in respect to its own real internal constitution, but subject is always to be construed as an abbreviation of subject superject. The ancient doctrine that no one crosses the same river twice is extended. No thinker thinks twice. And to put the matter more generally, no subject experiences twice. This is what Locke ought to have meant by his doctrine of time as a perpetual perishing. This repudiation directly contradicts Kant's first analogy of experience in either of its ways of phrasing, first or second edition. In the philosophy of organism, it is not substance which is permanent, but form. 
Form suffers changing relations. Actual entities perpetually perish subjectively, but are immortal objectively. Actuality in perishing acquires objectivity, while it loses subjective immediacy. It loses the final causation, which is its internal principle of unrest, and it acquires efficient causation whereby it is a ground of obligation characterizing the creativity. Actual occasions in their formal constitutions are devoid of all indetermination. Potentiality has passed into realization. They are complete and determinate matter of fact, devoid of all indecision. They form the ground of obligation, but eternal objects and propositions, and some more complex sort of contrasts, involve in their own natures indecision. They are, like all entities, potentials for the process of becoming. Their ingression expresses the definiteness of the actuality in question, but their own natures do not in themselves disclose in what actual entities this potentiality of ingression is realized. Thus they involve indetermination in a sense more complete than do the former set. A multiplicity merely enters into process through its individual members. The only statements to be made about a multiplicity express how its individual members enter into the process of the actual world. Any entity which enters into process in this way belongs to the multiplicity, and no other entities do belong to it. It can be treated as a unity for this purpose and this purpose only. For example, each of the six kinds of entities just mentioned are multiplicities, i.e. not the individual entities of the kinds, but the collective kinds of the entities. A multiplicity has solely a disjunctive relationship to the actual world. The universe comprising the absolutely initial data for an actual entity is a multiplicity. The treatment of a multiplicity as though it had the unity belonging to an entity of any one of the other six kinds produces logical errors. Whenever the word entity is used, it is to be assumed, unless otherwise stated that it refers to an entity of one of the six kinds and not to a multiplicity. There is no emergent evolution concerned with a multiplicity so that Every statement about a multiplicity is a disjunctive statement about its individual members. Entities of any of the first six kinds and generic contrasts will be called proper entities. In its development, the subsequent discussion of the philosophy of organism is governed by the belief that the subject predicate form of proposition is concerned with high abstractions except in its application to subjective forms. This sort of abstraction, apart from this exception, is rarely relevant to metaphysical description. The dominance of Aristotelian logic, from the late classical period onwards, has imposed on metaphysical thought the categories naturally derivative from its phraseology. His dominance of his logic does not seem to have been characteristic of Aristotle's own metaphysical speculations. The divergencies, such as they are in these lectures from other philosophical doctrines, mostly depend upon the fact that many philosophers, who in their explicit statements criticize the Aristotelian notion of substance, yet implicitly throughout their discussions presuppose that the subject predicate form of proposition embodies the finally adequate mode of statement about the actual world. The evil produced by the Aristotelian primary substance is exactly this habit of metaphysical emphasis upon the subject predicate form of proposition.